Good evening and welcome to this evening's lecture. Uh, great to see so many people here tonight. The event is organized tonight by the SOAS Food Studies Center and is part of the center's distinguished lecture series. The SOAS Food Studies Center fosters teaching and research on food and agriculture here at SOAS and also serves as a vehicle for connecting SOAS academics and students uh, with those sharing food-related interests beyond SOAS. We are interested in the political, economic, and cultural dimensions of food and the dynamic interactions of these dimensions, whether in the past, present, or future, from production through to consumption, not only in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, but also in the rest of the world. More than 40 members of uh, SOAS staff belong to the center, as do more than 20 SOAS research students and more than 100 students on taught courses at the school and alumni of these courses. We also have nearly 1,000 associate members, including students and academics from other universities, policymakers, activists, journalists, and makers and vendors of food. The center convenes the weekly SOAS Food Forum, distinguished lectures such as this evening's and other events. Should anyone wish to join the center as an associate member, which is free of charge, and to be placed on our email list, please send an email to soasfoodstudies at soas.ac.uk. Our distinguished, distinguished lectures are co-sponsored by Gastronomica, the, uh, the Journal of Critical Food Studies. I'd like to thank the journal's editor, Melissa Caldwell, who is here with us this evening, uh, as well as the University of California Press, which publishes the journal, for their continuing support for this lecture series. Tonight's lecture will be published in the journal and will also be, av be available on the SOAS Food Studies Center webpage. I'd also like to thank the Centers and Programs Office here at SOAS, especially Nena Chuku, Jane Savory, and Yasmin Jayasimi for all of their work behind the scenes organizing this event. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker. David E. Sutton is professor of anthropology at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. He holds a BA in general studies in the humanities, an MA in anthropology, and a PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago. He took his PhD in 1995, uh, and uh, the work is published as Memories Cast in Stone with Berg in 1998. During a postdoc in Oxford, where after spending time in Greece, where food had figured so prominently in daily life, he found himself in a place where the table settings were as, of as much importance as the food itself, uh, he started to think about making food more central to his research. Since the 90s, he has conducted research in Greece, much of this on the island of Kalymnos in the Eastern Aegean. His early work explored historical consciousness and the relevance of the past in daily life, ranging from naming practices to the ritual throwing of dynamite at Easter. He subsequently focused on everyday cooking practices in Kalymnos. In this work, he has examined how Kalymnians reproduce and innovate recipes, use tools as extensions of the body, and create their kitchen spaces. More recently, he has studied the so-called Greek financial crisis as seen through the lens of changing food practices, the theme he will address in this evening's lecture. Professor Sutton has been a leading figure in the study not only of food and cooking, but also, in relation to this, materiality, tools and technology, and memory and the senses. His work has contributed significantly to the study of gender and, more recently, to the study of political protest. He has also been a pioneer in the use of video in ethnographic research. He is author of Remembrance of Repasts, an Anthropology of Food and Memory, published by Berg in 2001. Hollywood Blockbusters, the Anthropology of Popular Movies, also published by Berg in 2009. And Secrets from the Greek Kitchen, 
cooking, cooking Skill and Everyday Life on an Aegean Island, published by the University of California Press in 2014. He is co-editor with David Barris of The Restaurant's book, Ethnographies of Where We Eat, published by Bloomsbury in 2007. These, as well as a great many journal articles, book chapters, and other writings. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce to you Professor David Sutton, who will be speaking tonight on the, the theme, Let Them Eat Stuffed Peppers, an argument of images on the role of food in understanding neoliberal austerity in Greece. David. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Harry, for that uh, really lovely introduction. And I'm really honored to be here tonight um, to talk to you all and um, to present what I've been working on and to get your feedback on it. Um, so let me start with a little bit about my title uh, because it's a long one. Uh, uh, the argument of images is a phrase I take from my mentor, uh, James Fernandez, who used it to talk about the synesthetic aspects of ritual in particular, and which inspired me in some of my synesthetic uh, ethnography. Um, the role of food in understanding neoliberal austerity in, in Greece, well, um, as I'm sure um, most of you know, um, Greece has uh, been in uh, an economic crisis some call it a financial crisis, some just call it a crisis, um, since 2009. And, um, uh, and unlike um, other European Union countries, it's been subject to um, a series of uh, programs, uh, austerity programs known as memoranda uh, that have been imposed by the International Monetary Fund, Fund and the European Union. Uh, and um, there, there were three of them, three memoranda, three programs. And then this summer, there was a fourth proposed. And uh, Greece had a referendum on it. And the Greek people overge overwhelmingly rejected uh, the program, 62% to 38%. And on Kalimnos, where I work, it was much higher. I think it was like 75%. Uh, uh, but the government, the uh, left-wing government known as Syriza, um, uh, 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 went ahead and signed the, the new memorandum uh, about a week later. Um, as for let them eat stuffed peppers, uh, well, I'm going to show you a very short video. Uh, and this was, um, this was uh, uh, in September. It was after, um, uh, on the eve of the re-election of the Syriza government. Uh, and um, they were interviewing uh, the deputy minister of social solidarity. And they were asking her, uh, how she planned, how the ministry planned to uh, help the Greek people who have been suffering under these austerity programs. And they have indeed been suffering. Um, uh, once again, maybe you've heard, but uh, uh, just for example, um, they've had a youth unemployment rate of 50 to 60 percent for many years now. Um, and, uh, and so this is what uh, she responded. Uh, 
πράγματα. Δηλαδή, πολύ φθηνά τρώει μια οικογένεια. Θα συνεχίσουμε στην ίδια λογική. Uh, okay, um, so just a couple of things about that. Um, uh, th this, uh, this statement um, provoked a lot of reaction. I, I won't tell you what it was right now, uh, but just to, to clarify a few things, she's suggesting that, um, uh, that uh, her ministry, just like the Greek people, will be able to economize and stretch things by um, doing things like making uh, what I've translated as stuffed peppers, but in fact, uh, the word yemista uh, is more general. It means stuffed vegetables. It can be tomatoes. It can be aubergines. Um, and basically, what you do is you, um, you fill the vegetable with uh, a combination of rice, um, meat if you have it, ground beef, um, and various herbs and spices. And, um, and you uh, bake it in the oven, or sometimes in an outdoor oven. It, and, and it's very nice, it's very delicious. It is, in some ways, as she's suggesting, kind of a Greek version of uh, that idea of nail broth or stone soup, if you're familiar with it, the idea of making something from, from nothing. Um, So, uh, I'm going to come back to that. Um, during the period um, as the crisis was unfolding, I had been working on um, my research on everyday cooking on the island of Kalimnos. And while I felt that my research did have wider implications, um, I wasn't thinking about politics with a capital P. But I began to hear resonances between food discourses and larger issues, which got my attention at the time. So for me, this actually harkened back to my, my initial PhD research on Kalimnos, where I was looking at how uh, local practices could inform the understanding of much larger issues, such as, for example, how local Greek naming practices I believe, illuminated the controversy over the naming of uh, Yugoslav Macedonia. Um, so uh, what's the broader perspective I'm uh, taking here? Um, no, me. Sorry about that. So I felt as I was getting into this, you know, of course I got into anthropology so that I, I wouldn't have to understand economics. <laughs> uh, but I realized at a certain point that I couldn't uh, actually uh, uh, go on with that. And so uh, as uh, motivated by what was going on, I really tr started trying to get my mind around certain things that were happening <coughs> and to get my mind around the concept of neoliberalism. Of course, neoliberalism, big concept, a lot of different perspectives. Uh, but the ones that I was drawn to were largely inspired by uh, the work of Karl Polanyi. Um, in his, uh, and he was a um, mid-century economic anthropologist. Uh, and he wrote a book, The Great Transformation, which, um, which was looking at the transformations of society around the eve of World War I. And and particularly, he was looking, he was interested in what he called the disembedding of the economy from society. The idea that with free markets, you have a separation of economy from society, perhaps for the first time in history, that was imposed by uh, what was called liberal economics. Um, and so a lot of people have, uh, have found this, uh, this concept useful. Can you hear me when I'm out here, too? Yeah? OK, I'll go back and forth. <coughs> hmm. uh, so a lot of people, anthropologists and others, have found uh, this idea useful to understand now neoliberalism, which is in some ways doing some of the same things. He had another really good concept uh, 
called the double movement. And the double movement was his uh, phrase for the idea that in response to uh, uh, the disembedding of the economy from society or claims to disembed the economy from society, <coughs> society protected itself. Society responded to this through protection of itself. And, uh, and he noted uh, in his work that this protection could take both right-wing and left-wing uh, forms. And anyone following the election in the United States can see that he's very prophetic. Uh, um, but but uh, coming at this uh, from my research on, on cooking, and as Harry described, I was looking at tool use and things like that. Um, one thing that struck me is that very few people who were talking about Karl Polanyi um, ever mentioned his brother, Michael Polanyi. And Michael Polanyi was a mid-century philosopher and uh, he was best known for um, talking about the concept of tacit knowledge, or the idea, as he put it, that we know more than we can say. And he explored this concept of tacit knowledge. He said that all knowledge has tacit dimensions. Even the knowledge, even the most explicit, objective knowledge produced by scientists has tacit dimensions. Um, so it got me, um, uh, it got me thinking, um, tacit knowledge, um, it, it was, it was very much similar. I was, I was kind of using a number of different concepts, not systematically, but tacit knowledge, embodied knowledge, um, situated knowledge, local knowledge. All of these were terms that recognize how knowledge is uh, based in context. Um, and, and of course, I was interested in, how, in cooking knowledge and what exactly was transmitted when we talk about cooking knowledge being transmitted. So when I'm talking about neoliberalism now, I'm talking about the belief that markets and privatization provide greater efficiency and superior solutions to economic questions, along with the belief that you can apply market logic to ever-increasing areas of life. And this often involves uh, processes which could be labeled abstraction, after James Carrier, um, like commodity fetishism, like the kind of abstraction of knowledge from social contexts that we see in university assessment schemes and audit cultures. And as Marilyn Strathern notes, the, the pressure to make intellectual work visible, measurable, and transferable favors disembedded knowledge that attacks the very qualities of complexity and sensitivity that anthropologists are taught to value. Uh, so disembedded, the, uh, just the, the same term that uh, Polanyi was using, the other Polanyi, Karl Polanyi, embedded and disembedded. In terms of food, I see a similar tendency that I would call neoliberal in the notion that cooking knowledge and even taste itself can be standardized and abstracted from social settings. As we see in all kinds of um, projects, contemporary projects, from Cook's Illustrated Magazine and America's Test Kitchen, if you're familiar with those, um, to many avatars of molecular gastronomy, not all, but many, um, to the notion circulated last year that um, the Watson supercomputer is going to provide us with all kinds of previously untried but delicious ingredient combinations, such as mushrooms with strawberries. Who knew? 
let me contrast this briefly to what we know as anthropologists of food. For example, in Anita von Poser's recent ethnography of foodways of the Bosom of Papua New Guinea, she notes of their staple sago pudding, regardless of whether it appeared to her to have the right consistency or preparation, Bosom insisted that a sociable person cannot fail to produce tasty sago pudding. Or in my own work on Kalimnos, where I showed that techniques such as what I call cutting in the hand, which is something that I analyze at length in my, in my book, could not be abstracted from a total socio-material setting in which they make sense as part of the flow of a particular cultural life. So this is my context for beginning to make sense of the role of food and discourse, as discourse and practice in people's experience of the Greek crisis. Now, now, I first kind of um, became aware that, um, that this might be an interesting issue when I was listening to various ministers talking about um, the causes of the crisis. Um, so I remember it was kind of in a, in a documentary, and they had they had back to back. They had I don't know if it would have been was it George Osborne back then in 2011. Uh, they had the British uh, <coughs> Chancellor, and he said, he basically was saying, you know, we all benefited, so we all have to share the burden. And that was pretty much his expression. It was very unmetaphorical. The Irish minister said, well, you know, we all pardoned. <laughs> but the Greek uh, minister, in this case, Deputy Prime Minister, said, Mazita uh, Fagami. Uh, which I'm translating, it literally means we all, we ate it together, but the it is the money, we all ate the money. Um, and this is, this is, I mean, the, the, ver the, the, Greece used the word eating to mean a lot of things. And, um, and this gives you a sense of kind of the range of the word to eat. It wasn't a kind of wild metaphor for him. It's, it's a common expression. But people reacted to it pretty strongly. Um, and uh, and I, I, I tried to capture um, uh, their reactions in this. I think it kind of is summed up by this uh, comment. Uh, and in this picture, you see um, uh, a group of people um, uh, known as the Troika, which were the European institutions which were imposing the austerity program. And they're cutting up a cake, a New Year's cake, because in Greece, on New Year's, you cut up a cake, and whoever gets the piece with the coin in it is lucky for the next year. Um, so they're cutting up a cake of, uh, 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 this was in, uh, on the eve of 2012, it says 2012 Greek, but they're giving out the pieces, and it says uh, one piece for the European lenders, one piece for the Greek banks, one piece for Goldman Sachs, and Goldman Sachs actually was pretty instrumental in the Greek crisis um, in a number of different ways. Uh, in fact, I believe that the European director of Goldman Sachs is actually now the head of the European Commission. Uh, one piece for Angela Merkel, and one piece for Reichenbach, who was the, uh, the kind of overseer of the Troika. And in the background, some very kind of disheveled and skinny Greek people are saying, and now they're going to tell us that we all ate it together. <laughs> um. So this, is, this was an initial context, a kind of context of claims of collective um, responsibility and responses about, well, let's parse out that responsibility a little bit more. Um, another thing that, um, that I noticed early on, um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, uh, I'm jumping ahead. So, so this, is a, this was a last year. Um, and this is a kind of picking up on this, uh, this same theme, but in a slightly different way. In this case, 
uh, a Greek man named Mr. Mitsos, a kind of typical Greek, is talking to Christine Lagarde, the head of the uh, IMF, and he's saying, he's saying, um, but why do you want it? My, why do you want my my uh, my vine leaf? <laughs> and she's saying, um, Lomadakia, a stuffed grape leaf. I'm going to make a Mediterranean cuisine. <laughs> and in the pot where she's cooking it, it says lowering of uh, wages and, and pensions and, and raising of taxes, uh, which has been a big part of the austerity uh, program. And, um, and in fact, um, I think this, this, this cartoon actually brings up an important concept, which is when you talk to Greeks about the crisis, one of the words that they use a lot is dignity or axioprepia. And the sense of dignity um, that they're talking about, well, this, this cartoon is kind of playing on the idea of personal dignity, right? But, um, but uh, uh, Axioprepia kind of means dignity in a, in a slightly broader sense, or maybe a lot broader sense. It really um, uh, suggests the possibility to reproduce habits of life that make you a Greek person. Um, so it kind of resonates with the idea of moral economy uh, from E.P. Thompson. Um, uh, it kind of also suggests the idea that there's a problem with making profits on people's suffering. Uh, and, um, and in fact, you know, the people I knew on Kalimnos, for example, uh, one guy I'm very close friends with, he was the um, computer uh, administrator for the mayor's office. Uh, he is. And uh, he saw his, um, his wages cut 48% in one day in 2012. And over the period of the last six years, his taxes have brought up <coughs> over 500%. Right. So another um, food-related practice that I was interested in uh, early on, uh, this was really popular back in 2011, and I analyzed it along with uh, my my former student and colleague, Leonidas Spornelis, and we wrote about it a little bit, so I'll just talk about it very briefly. It's called yogurting, and it means throwing yogurt at politicians or people in authority. And one of the things that struck us about it is that it seemed to be accepted for a long time. It was like, it was kind of something that people said, oh yeah, you know, I mean, people weren't, to my knowledge, getting thrown in jail for yogurting. Uh, and so, of course, we asked, uh, why yogurt? Did there just happen to be a lot of yogurt handy? <laughs> and uh, and what, one of the things we suggested is that, uh, that yogurt is, in fact, uh, one of the foods that um, has an identifiable Greekness to it. Uh, in fact, I saw this um, uh, f uh, Greek fans at FIFA 2014 wearing uh, Greek yogurt cups. <laughs> uh, but I also had the very odd experience last summer traveling through a lot of international airports. And I heard the same, um, almost the same discussion twice. It was, um, uh, it was some non-Greek people talking about the Greek crisis because this was right on the eve of the referendum and there was a suggestion that if the Greeks uh, voted against the austerity package, they might be thrown out of Europe. So people had some consciousness of it. And I heard two different conversations where, where somebody said, oh yeah, the Greeks are doing pretty bad, did you hear about it? And they said, yeah, well, you know, what do they produce? They only produce yogurt. They have a yogurt economy. <laughs> so this, as, as food scholars, we know that food has that double-edgedness. It can be an identifier and also a slur, right? But what we were arguing uh, was that, um, that really what people were expressing <coughs> by throwing yogurt was that 
the, the neoliberal austerity package was somehow against Greekness, that it was um, somehow antithetical to Greekness, and that they were going to actually cover the politicians in this substance that represented Greekness, to remind them of their Greekness. And I'm going to try and convince you of that in some of the other slides uh, that I'm going to show. Um, now, these next two slides I, I wanted to show you together because in some ways they look similar. Uh, in one case, you have um, people reaching for a bag of tomatoes. And in the other case, you have people reaching for some bags of potatoes. Um, and, um, but the context of these two pictures are very different. In this picture, uh, this was as, during some of the protests in 2011. Uh, uh, this was in uh, Thessaloniki, Greece's second city. And um, uh, f farmers from northern Greece drove, drove their potatoes into Thessaloniki and handed them out to protesters as an act of, they said, solidarity. And this was, in fact, the beginnings of what later became known as the potato movement or the anti-middleman movement, which was the first time in quite a while of trying to really connect producers and consumers more directly in Greece. And it has had some success. Um, it's had different fates. Um, but uh, there are a number of anthropologists who are doing studies of it now or learning about it. Um, the, their studies are coming out as we speak. This other picture, um, people express a lot of consternation about this picture because it, it presented an image of Greeks as desperate. Um, and they said, is this really our Greece? Uh, and others said, yes, it is our Greece. Let's, let's recognize that. Um, but to me, the striking thing is that it reminded me of um, uh, a quote from Eduardo Galeano when he says, I don't believe in charity. I believe in solidarity. Charity is vertical. It moves from top to bottom. Solidarity is horizontal. It respects the other. I have much to learn from other people. And in fact, um, a lot of the discussion in, in Greece about um, uh, efforts to relieve people's needs and people's hunger is phrased in terms of an opposition between charity and solidarity. Uh, and there are big charity organizations in Greece, including the Greek Orthodox Church um, and some very wealthy foundations. Um, and a lot of people, particularly people on the left, but uh, uh, more generally, say, you know, we're not doing charity, we're doing solidarity. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, there can be some fuzziness there. It's, it's not, it's not so, always so cut and dry. But I think it's, it's an important uh, distinction uh, that we want to think about. Um, so we'll see this in a couple of these slides coming up. So this is, um, this is uh, one of the most successful um, movements to uh, come out of the uh, crisis. It's called the Social Kitchen Movement. Uh, this one is, uh, I think, the most well-known, O Alos Athropos, the other human. And it started in a Athens, and uh, it, uh, it's been um, expanded all over Greece. And they're pretty good about um, at least once a week getting together and cooking a meal in some public location with the idea that uh, anyone who uh, can um, should contribute what they can, and anyone who can't should just come, and they'll cook the meal, and they'll sit down and eat it together. And in fact, the, the founder of this had some phrase. He said, you know, if I just give you food, maybe you'd just throw it back at my head. But if we sit down together as humans, we can have a dialogue. Um, and you know, I think it's really important to, as anthropologists to contextualize this within 
Greek um, social practices because on Kalimnos, people are feeding each other all the time. It's, it's just um, so common for neighbors to make a little extra and bring it over to their neighbors. And then the other neighbor sometime will bring something over to them. Nobody's keeping track, but it's a constant process and you're doing it for all kinds of reasons, not just out of people's needs, although they do do it in some cases for people who are in need, but, uh, but more generally, uh, often you're doing it um, to remember a dead relative. When, you're, when your parent dies, you cook extra for other people to think of them. Um, so there are all kinds of reasons for this, but, um, but it's very much embedded in social practice um, to share food like this. Um, Now this next slide, I don't want to suggest that food is all about uh, solidarity or that it doesn't include its exclusions, and certainly it does. And this is a food distribution by um, the notorious Greek uh, neo-Nazi party Golden Dog. And they have been providing some social services to desperate people in parts of Greece along with um, enacting violence on migrants and others. Uh, but their, their food distribution, as you can see here, is, uh, is a more serious matter. Uh, and uh, and it's, uh, it's very much um, pitched in hyper-nationalist terms. This is food by and for Greeks and nobody else. So I just wanted to make that point that the food can have those other uses. Um, now this is uh, this is the logo for um, the uh, suspended coffee movement in Greece. You may have heard of suspended coffee. It started, I believe, in Naples. It spread throughout the world, um, and it means buying a coffee for someone who will have it later on. Who maybe couldn't afford it. I mean, there are different versions of it, and I think the differences are important. Um, so in Greece, um, you, uh, you buy your coffee, and then you say, and I'll buy a suspended coffee, and you, you, pay, you pay 70%, and the, the coffee shop covers the other 30%. Uh, and then when somebody comes along and says they want, are there any suspended coffees, uh, the coffee shop will tell them, yes, there are. Um, and um, as, with the, as with the social kitchen movement, um, the idea behind suspended coffee is not so much charity, but neighborhood cohesion. Uh, by allowing people to participate in daily rituals of life, as, as, the, um, as the, one of the founders of the movement in Greece says, there's so many people that just sit in their apartments and don't go out because they can't afford a simple coffee. We want them to go out of the house, socialize, and meet their neighbors. In one neighborhood, we even had a group of women baking cakes, which they gave to the cafes to serve with the coffee. So it really is a neighborhood initiative Um, sorry. Uh, and um, and it really it also has to be put in the context once again of Greek culture, in which coffee shop sociability has deep, deep roots. Uh, and lots of anth anthropologists of Greece have written about this. Um, it used to be a male social space, but for the last 30 years it's definitely become a co-ed social space, but it is a primary space for socializing. It's not for going to the coffee shop with your iPad or doing your work or something like that. It's a socializing space. Um, and, and in fact, especially during the crisis, people have talked about how important it is to be able to still go out to the coffee shop, to feel that they are not isolated, that they are still humans, um, that they are still able to engage in social relationships. 
And this, in fact, as the, the anthropologist Daniel Knight has written about, um, provokes some uh, uh, negative reactions on the part of some northern Europeans, particularly in the German press, I guess, uh, maybe the German finance minister, Schäuble, um, who think, who say, look at those Greeks sitting in coffee shops. If they're sitting in coffee shops buying coffees, clearly they're not suffering enough. Um, but there's a, there's a phrase here that's really relevant. It takes us back to what I was talking about, about the notion of dignity. It's a, it's a phrase, Ifdokia telik kalaperasi. And a literal trans, translation of it would be poverty um, requires good living. But good living is um, is more expansive term here. It really once again refers to the idea that you can um, you can imagine um, stretching things so that you are able to reproduce your uh, identities and social relations. Um, that you are not going to. Um, turn into uh, an isolated individual, which the Greeks imagine that many people in Northern Europe live like that. Um, uh, and, um, and I heard a lot of people talking about this on Kalimnos. People in coffee shops kind of performed their coffee shop practice. And they said, you know, here we are in the coffee shop. It's the crisis. We may as well be gathering together, having a coffee. Uh, and in fact, somebody said that uh, instead of uh, poverty requires good living, the phrase now is ikrisi theli kalaparasi, the crisis requires good living. And you know, this could, um, this could involve, um, different things from going to the coffee shop. It could involve, um, uh, you know, staying home with your friends and inviting them over for a pizza instead of going out to the taverna, uh, but finding ways to stretch things so that you can still say that you're human beings who have social relationships. Uh, I'm going to talk really briefly about this. I think this is an interesting art project that two Greek um, artists who I think have studied anthropology as well um, put on. Um, they, um, they gathered um, bitter oranges, which are for the most part used for decorative purposes in Greek cities. They gathered them for, from three different neighborhoods in Athens and in Thessaloniki. This is Syntagma Square. And they, and they made... Um, what's called glico to, to kutalyu, um, a spoon suite out of them, a different one from each neighborhood. And they serve them at, um, uh, at a food conference in Greece. Uh, they serve them at the o Oxford Food Symposium. Uh, they serve them at a gathering in Germany. And they wanted to provoke some dialogue um, with the people they were serving them to. And, um, and not surprisingly, they got very different reactions. And the people in Germany and England were very interested in the different flavors and the, you know, the, how the different flavors came from different locations. The people in Greece thought this was a really interesting strategy. They thought, you know, we need to be doing more of this. We need to, you know, maybe you could market it. Maybe you could make some money off of this. Or um, maybe this is something we should be doing to help people. Um, so that they can be enjoying this, this resource, right? Um, you know, and obviously it's not um, filling nutritional needs. It's just orange peel and sugar water. But it's actually part of coffee practices. That is, you'll serve spoon sweets, um, especially 
A little bit in coffee shops, not so much, but mostly when you have people over for coffee. So it's part of this, this same kind of uh, reproducing sociability. Uh, so these are all pictures of what they did. And the one thing that I kind of um, uh, asked them about, um, and uh, uh, I don't know what they think about it, they haven't kind of totally responded, but, but I thought it was interesting that this is a, this is a bittersweet um, taste and kind of the symbolism of bittersweetness as, as, a, as, a, as a food that's representing the crisis and whether they, whether they felt that there was anything kind of connected to the taste of bittersweetness um, as a way of thinking about history or the past or, or the present. Um, this takes us up to last summer when, uh, when the referendum was going on. Uh, and once again, um, a yes vote on the referendum was to accept the new austerity package, a no, bo no vote to re was to reject it. Um, and so this restaurant offered a yes burger, which as you can see was chickpea patties on a dry bun, and the no burger, Greek style with creamy feta and sun-dried tomatoes. Um, and so, I mean, uh, once again, it's interesting the symbolism of food uh, because um, there were other protests that I haven't included in this presentation which, which played on the idea of foreign food in Greece. But this one, they're talking about two fairly Greek things. Uh, but chickpeas have an association with, with poverty or even sometimes some people associate it with them with World War II. Um, and uh, obviously, um, creamy fat on sun-dried tomatoes sound a lot, a lot nicer. Um, and so I was, I was interested in kind of things going on around the time of the referendum because one of the big issues was that people felt uh, that if they voted um, against the austerity packages, they might be thrown out of the Eurozone or even thrown out of the European Union. That was kind of what some of the people who said we should vote yes because otherwise this is going to happen, right? Um, and so there was a kind of question about the Euro itself at play uh, and how Greeks felt, felt about the Euro. And this is something that's been, I think, evolved in interesting ways over the, what is it, 12 or 13, 13 years since the Euro was introduced. Um, because you know, people on Calendar still tell me like that the euro is doesn't doesn't reflect value in ways that they understand. Uh, and I haven't really studied this in depth. Uh, my former student actually was there during the time of the transition when the drachma and the euro were both circulating together, and he had people telling him things like, you know, I can see buying clothes with a, with a euro or other things like that. But how am I going to buy tomatoes with a euro? Tomatoes are Greek. I can only understand the value of tomatoes in drachmas. Right. So, uh, you know, so this got me interested in kind of the relationship of food and money in this discourse. And some, some of the ways that food and money are like uh, counter symbols to each other. Sometimes they overlap, we all ate the money, and sometimes they're an antithesis to each other, right? And so uh, I'm going to explore that a little bit more in these slides. Um, this, was a, this was a picture that, that circulated on the internet. Um, this was part of the Yes campaign um, saying, you know, we should stay in Europe. It says, uh, we should stay in Europe. But of course, the, the photo is suggesting the consequences of that, which is dumpster diving. Um, this was a picture from the uh, the rally just before the referendum. There were there were big rallies, uh, both for yes and no. And this was the yes rally, um, 
You could say a number of things about this picture, including the fact that the sign the little girl is holding that has misspelled Europe in it. Um, but, um, but the interesting thing to me was the, Euro, the 10 euro note plastered on the guy's head. Now I could read this in, in two very different ways. In one way this is kind of actually referencing a Greek practice which is when uh, a musician is playing for you, you might kind of dance over to him and slap a, a, a tip on his head or stick it in his pocket or something like that. But this also seems to me to symbolize the idea of identification, that, this, that we are the money now. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's standing for some, this other idea here, I think. Um, and then uh, one of my colleagues sent me this, uh, uh, and uh, apparently this is a graffiti that you can find in many places. Um, it says um, ATM Society. Um, so it has the idea, are we an ATM society now? But it also is, is, is it has a, another kind of twist to it, which is that it can be a pun. Uh, it can mean atimi kinomia, or um, honorless, honorless society. So uh, the ATM society is an honorless society. Um, and ATMs were actually the focus of a lot of concern last summer because uh, for very complicated reasons, uh, Greece uh, uh, had to put capital controls uh, and people could only get out 60 euros at a time. Uh, so there were a lot of lines at ATMs and sometimes the media showed to scare people again, they showed people fighting at ATMs. Like once again, if you vote no, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be fighting for our money. Um, but on Kalamnos, in fact, my friends told me that ATMs were actually very social places, sociable places. That is, people gathered together and they were joking and they were saying, yeah, do we really need to take out money today? You know, uh, maybe not. <laughs> uh, so once again, this, this kind of opposition between money and food sociability. Now I want to talk briefly about um, what uh, I'm sure is on a lot of your minds, which is the refugee crisis. Uh, and this photo is, uh, um, got a lot of play in Greece. In fact, it was singled out by the pr Greek prime minister and he said, this is the image that we want to present of Europe, not a Europe of borders and fences but this Europe. And the woman who's feeding the refugee uh, woman's baby, um, she is actually one of the people who's been nominated for the Nobel Prize on behalf of all of the volunteers in Greece. Um, and you see lots of things like this, you, I mean, if you've followed it at all, um, uh, ordinary Greek people, uh, by and large, have been tremendously generous. Uh, and uh, here you have this Greek baker who's sharing his own product, and the word philotimo, or honor, love of honor, is, um, is on top there. Um, and, you know, the, the, from all that I, I've read and followed and talked to colleagues about it, um, you know, there's, there's really been um, a tremendous effort on part of ordinary people. Not on the part of the government or the kind of UN or big NGOs. They've been dropping the ball. But ordinary people in solidarity networks have been making a tremendous effort. And it's really important, once again, Context is everything. It's like, why are they, why are they um, making this effort? One narrative says um, it's, because, it's because Greeks are generous. 
philoxenia, hospitality. Um, and this narrative is kind of nationalist. It says, yes, we are the generous ones. Turks aren't generous. Northern Europeans aren't generous. We're generous. Uh, and the other thing about philoxenia, though, is as anthropologists have analyzed, it's, it's definitely hierarchical. It's like, it's once again, it's like that, that charity. It's like, I'm, I'm in the position of power. But, um, but in fact, um, many people, when you ask them about it, and, and there's, there's actually uh, somebody, at, I think at LSC, who's, who's talked about this. Um, her name is uh, Mirja Yorgio. Uh, but other anthropologists like Rene Hirschhan and historians like Nick Dumanis have written about this in the past. Um, there's really, it's, 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 it's not about hierarchy, it's about identity. Yorgia uh, uh, says, um, when, you, when she asked people, why are they doing it, they said, it could be me. It could be me. And this is... Um, Something that, uh, to just quote uh, Nina Glick-Schiller, who's been working on what she calls cosmopolitan solidarity, uh, cosmopolitan sociability, sorry. In Germany and in the north of England, she, wrote, she writes that the welcome that some Europeans gave the refugees in the fall of 2015 was not an expression of tolerance to strangers, but an acknowledgement that we are all facing the consequences of a global warring and the depredations and displacements of capital accumulation. In that sense, we are all refugees. Well, and in an additional sense, many of those older uh, Greeks who are donating so much, they were refugees, uh, either during World War II or if or their parents or grandparents were refugees during the Asia Minor uh, catastrophe. So they are speaking from uh, personal knowledge. Um, how am I doing on time? OK. Uh, so really quick on this one then. Um, so it's not always rosy, though. This is a protest. This I found this uh, about a week ago. Uh, a protest to the um, Chamber of Commerce of Chios because apparently some merchants are not happy about solidarity actions because they don't want the refugees to be getting free food. They want the refugees to be buying their food. And so this is the social kitchen on Chios, part of the social kitchen movement. They go to, to the Chamber of Commerce in protest, and they say basically, you know, stop harassing us. But they do it by bringing um, cups of lentils, which they distribute to each member of the Chamber of Commerce. So they actually are using food to shame um, these people um, who are, once again, putting profit and calculation before um, sociability and solidarity. Um, and very briefly about Kalimnos, um, how, do, how are people on Kalimnos surviving? Well, those who can are sending their children, as they have in the past, to, uh, as, as, as economic migrants to some of the few places that still take economic migrants, like Australia. And um, one family that I knew, um, the mother is pictured here, sorry, um, her son has been in Australia for something over a year. In the course of a year, he sent them roughly 12,000 euro. So quite a substantial amount. He's basically dedicating himself to keeping his parents and his sister afloat. And the mother here is um, cleaning oregano, uh, which you know used to be one of the many things you might do to provision yourself. But now things like this are being used to make a little bit of money. So she's going to bag it up and sell it to tourists, as she might do with wild capers or other things. Um, sometimes they collect snails, um, 
which used to be just a delicacy that you would, you would eat and maybe share with friends while they c collected extra snails and, and sold them to neighbors. Um, and, and it called on a lot of local knowledge, a lot of knowledge that could be forgotten, like how do you keep the snails? How do you cook the snails? Only the grandmother remembered that or knew that. These aren't recipes written down. So this is one of the ways that people are surviving through local knowledge. I'll give, give you one more brief example. I've got plenty. Um, there's a dish called kavarmas that I had never in my 30 years ha had anybody had made on Kalimnes because it's basically pork that you preserve by cooking it in fat and it preserves for a long time. And uh, the sponge divers would take it on the sponge boats because the, it would last for them. Um, but um, nobody, had, nobody had made it. Um, but some, people were making it. At least a few people were making it. And I said, why are you making cover mas? They said, well, you never know. Um, who knows? We might not have electricity in the future. We might not have refrigerators. We may as well still know how to make those things that... Um, can keep us going. So this is, you know, very much kind of related to some of the things that uh, that that minister was saying about um, stretching things uh, and using tacit knowledge or local knowledge. Um, so to come back to that minister statement, um, and here's another quick video of a protest outside of that minister's office. Oops. Okay, so they're saying um, basically show us the money so that we can eat uh, stuff that, uh, because these are municipal workers who haven't been paid in months and basically they're saying you know, we don't even have enough money to make yummy stuff. Um, so why were people so upset with this minister? Um, basically, it's not that what she was saying was wrong. It was that um, this is not something you bring out in the open. And she certainly didn't have the right to say it. Because once again, not she, like other ministers, but not like the Greek people, she wasn't suffering. She didn't. She wasn't having to make yummy stuff. So, uh, so to, to say that that the Greek people should be doing this was uh, was very upsetting to people. Um, so to to kind of bring start to bring things to a close, um, here's a, a quote from Annalise Riles. Uh, she says. The compulsion toward reciprocity and exchange relations, the compulsion to create and continually rejuvenate relations based on debt and mutual obligation is in fact the basis of all ethics and sociality, the source of our humanity, and what we can return to at points at which grand ideologies such as neoliberalism, neoliberalism fail us. And so this is what I've been talking about, the way that um, uh, the way that neoliberalism is not Greek is that it, it doesn't recognize that sociability is the basis of society. And that sociability calls on all kinds of local knowledge and tacit knowledge for its reproduction. All right. Um, so, uh, so while food can be used, um, certainly it can be used for neoliberal or exclusionary purposes, and money can be culturally redeemed. In broad terms, money stands for a spirit of calculation and antisocial profiteering, uh, profiteering, which is something I've developed in some of my other work on Kalimnian shopping. And food stands for sociability and the embeddedness of knowledge. And I would propose that there is something com of comparative value 
in this ethnography and that we will find similar meanings anywhere in which a robust food culture, a cuisine in Sidney Mintz's use of the term still exists and thrives and is faced with the threat of neoliberal ideologies and practices. But that's for all of you to tell me. And lastly, the more I study food, the more convinced I become that food studies needs to be at the very center of anthropology. And, um, you know, my mother was an anthropologist, and she was, um, I think, in many ways ahead of her times. She was studying social movements back in the 1950s. She was studying transnational migration in the 1980s. But, um, but she, she wondered why I was writing a whole book about food back in 2001. And when I finished that book and told her what my next project was, she said, you're going to write another book about food? <laughs> but um, I think my point is that food is not only a window onto other domains of life. Is, is not only deeply woven into practices of kinship, exchange, and ritual, those domains that we have traditionally considered central to our anthropological project. But food itself is one such domain, absolutely critical to people's daily reproduction of what matters to them about their lives. And as food scholars, I think it's time that we own up to this. Um, so I'll leave you with this, one of my favorite comic strips. Uh, this was uh, on New Year's this year, and uh, it's uh, not talking about Greece, but somehow appropriate, I think. Um, and, uh, and thank you. Thanks, thanks to Harry, Jacob, uh, Nenechuku, uh, Leo Vornelis, Neni Panaya, Stamatis Amarai Rianakis, and uh, Nafsika Papa Haralambus.